whatever needs to get done to get to move along. Or to have dinner that night. Or yeah. to be able to, you know. <laughs> yeah. I gotta or, flush the toilet the at some point, you know. Right. <laughs> or to have a spouse that'll still talk to you then. Right. right. <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today, I'm joined by Ian Schwant, professional estimator and regular podcast host. How's it going, everybody? Kylie Jacques, GBA editor, tap dancer, and lady with great <laughs> extraordinary dancing chops generally. Wow. Kylie Jacques. That's in a different kind of introduction. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> nice and to see our, you all. And our producer, Jeff Rose. Hi there. Uh, you can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can uh, email questions to the same address. No, you can't. You can email your questions at fh 3 podcast at taunton.com. Boy, I was, thought I was doing okay for a while, but <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you guys on the show today. Thank you. Yeah, great to be here. So, Kylie, how's your house? I thought I would share my um, water testing results. Because oh, I learned, right. I, I, learned, I learned some things. And, you know, I didn't do a, a very thorough job of researching what I was getting myself into when I went to the lab to get my test. But I essentially told them I wanted to make sure that my water was okay for drinking. And... It's a little strange. So they give, she said, okay, here's the kit you need. So I get home with the kit. There's three bottles and there's some paperwork to fill out. And on the paperwork, there are these options for things you want to test. So I included arsenic, you know, um, lead, uh, VOCs, radon. You know, essentially I was like, check, check, check. Yep. I want to know about all of that. So I bring my test kit back, my water samples, and I find out that for the $100 I'm about to spend, I can't do essentially any of that. <laughs> right? She said, <laughs> I, and maybe everybody, maybe this is common knowledge, but I didn't know it. I've never had water tested before. So anyway, um, what you can get for a baseline test, which does tell you the general safety of whether, you know, you're, you're drinking water, um, and, and the good news is mine is drinkable. Um, and these are the things that you get for $100, at least in Connecticut. Um, the parameters, is as they call them, the biological inorganic compounds, such as chlorine. Uh, metals include copper, iron, and mag manganese. Manganese. How do you say that? Manganese. 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 Uh, minerals, chloride, and then hardened sodium sulfite. Nutrients, including nitrate and nitrite. And then you get some feedback on the color, odor, pH, and turbidity. These are good things to know. But sure. if I really wanted to get what Mark had done, A, I wish I had been told that I needed an entirely different kit. You know, <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I, that would have been good knowledge. I may have splurged for more. Uh, I'd like to know about the arsenic and lead, to be honest. So, what does anyway. that test cost, Kylie? Did you get that far with the yeah, water test? Yeah, you mean for the more comprehensive? Yeah, one hundred and sixty dollars. Which, had I known that, I may, but I was already there. I already had my samples. Uh, I may, I may have, I may have gone that route. Mm -hmm. They didn't do a super job of explaining what I was getting for my baseline test. So, can I assume this is like the same uh, a group of tests that one would? get done if you were uh, doing a real estate transfer uh, yes. is, my, is my guess, right? You're so, exactly right. Yep. So what they really are looking for is like fecal coliform and stuff that can make you immediately sick, not yeah. things that might have a long term. Long term. term. Right. Which to be honest, it was the long term stuff. I already, I've been drinking it for four years. I know that I'm not getting immediately sick. Right. You know, but there we have it. Well, at least you're like not drinking, drinking toxic water. Right. Yeah. As far as I know. As far as we know. <laughs> Talk to me in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, you know, water testing is kind of interesting science-wise. They oh, do yeah. this, this whole interpretation guide and so. So where, where have, did you find any good places to learn more about the things you can test in a, in a normal test and the more comprehensive tests? No, I mean, I thought by going to this lab, I mean, that's their whole thing. And they're called the Aqua, Envir Aqua Environmental testing lab. Um, I, I thought 
that they would inform me, but I now know that I should have done more research on my own. Mm. So no, I ha- I haven't looked into it beyond but what I, I learned was just from them. Curious if there is I'm a good sure resource where I'm we sure can point are. people, but yeah, uh, you know what? I will look into it and add it to the show notes, whatever I find. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, sure. Going above and beyond today. Hey, I try. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, have you been working on your place or have you been uh, relaxing and enjoying it? So uh, it's been some relaxing and enjoying it, but also planning on what we're going to do in the spring and summer. Uh, We've decided we're really going to focus on the outside of the house and try and get the rest of our landscaping done. And we're also building a pole barn and I want to put my shop inside of it and have our solar array on the roof. Mm. So I've been doing a lot of reading about how far above and beyond standard pole barn construction you have to go to be able to do everything that I want to do. And it's kind of making me rethink like, is, is a pole barn really a good idea if I have to add this much lumber and extra trusses to it? So Patrick, don't you have an entire series on the building of your barn? I do. Um, but more importantly, I went to someone who actually knows what they're doing and had to confront all these decisions, Andy Grace. And I, uh, in a couple issues, we're going to have that feature in the magazine. Um, but there's a lot more to it, Ian, right? Than, yeah. than as first meets the eye to make them at all energy efficient. Yeah. And it's what I was going to do for my shop was just build an air seal box inside the pole barn. You know, we needed to have 12 foot high eaves to get equipment in there for the farm and the other stuff we're going to store. So I was just going to take a corner and build like a 28 by 30 or whatever air sealed box inside and just heat that. Um, But just even to have the amount of solar panels on it that we need is going to cover the bulk of the cell facing roof exposure and just making sure that we can do things that we want to do to it in the future. If we ever do any more finishes on the inside of it, it's just, it's a lot to think about. Have you guys been following Randy Williams has been working on a similar project? Yeah, I yeah, it, I haven't been, but it sounds like something he's planning to write about it for GBA at some point. Um, but he said, how did he phrase it? This he calls it the barn dominium, yep. pole barn with similar functions as what you're talking about, and it's a little more high performance, is how I think yeah. he put it. It was actually one of his Instagram posts that made me sit down and think like, wow, this probably isn't going to be as easy as I think it's going to be of just calling and being like, I need some pole barn material and putting it up and then finding out I can't put solar panels on it or can't finish the inside. So why did you choose that type of structure? Can I answer? It's pretty, pretty it's standard. Cheap. <laughs> it's cheap. cheap. Uh, yeah. It's cheap and it's, it's super standard. Here mm-hmm. in Wisconsin, it's, you mm-hmm. know, my dad has two of them on the farm already, and we're putting one up here to take on some overflow equipment of his and have a space for some of the things that Sarah and I want to do off of our piece of farmland. Mm-hmm. But the other thing I've been working on is, I know I've mentioned on the podcast before that we got the house done enough uh, with certain parts of the interior and I, I recently was given a list by the boss of things that are no longer done enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like this gal. <laughs> so this, this What's on weekend, the list, Ian? Uh, so one of the things that we did for our uh, HRV was I did uh, ducks coming up out of the floor and just like little six inch round ones. And I got decorative, uh, like punched steel, fancy little grates for them. I like those. Which are supposed to get routed into the floor which I just took double-sided tape and stuck them down to the floor. <laughs> so uh, now I need to make a nice router jig and, and actually inset them into the floor this weekend. Huh. That's not terrible. No, it's not terrible, and it's yeah. fun work. But, uh, you know, if, if it wasn't eight below outside right now, I'd try and finish drywalling the garage, but I don't think <laughs> that's a good idea. Oh, that sounds miserable. Jeff, have you had any projects uh, besides like shoveling snow and dealing with ice and stuff? Not really. I mean, uh, had to had to replace my uh, mailbox because the plow took it out. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, so I had that happen once. I've I've had that happen. What do yeah. you do when the ground is frozen, or were you able to? Oh, they they just ripped it off the post. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just I I think they must have gotten a new plow because it's been in the same place for eighteen years. Oh, hasn't wow. been a problem. They've hit it twice this year. 
Maybe, yeah, maybe someone wider. on the town is mad at you. <laughs> it's hard not to take those things personally. <laughs> I know. It's like, and it was an expensive mailbox. Oh, let's see. When, when we moved in, I found all of these really cool mailboxes, and I just thought somebody's going to hit it with a tractor or a snowplow. Yeah. I just or can't, take it. can't do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, or take it. Yeah. I uh, worked a little on my stairs over the long Martin Luther King weekend. And, Are you uh, being you're being so modest, Patrick? Those look so great. Well, thank you. Uh, I had no idea that's the vision you had. Honestly, when I opened well, that photo this morning, I thought, oh, "Holy Moses, this is gorgeous." It needs some painting, but it's largely done now, and it sure is a happy time and on the homestead here. So, uh, new strongly- projects are on the horizon. I strongly encourage listeners to look at what Patrick built. It's beautiful. Yeah, I'm, I'm pleased. Uh, it's really a luxury and wonderful when you can, like, live with stuff and let it evolve and uh, let it, I don't know, take shape organically is how I would describe it. I, I'm not very good at coming to final decisions on paper. I like to look at stuff in the real world. I want to say one last thing about your staircase. Yeah. I think it's such a striking example of how to make a small space really work. You know, the way that you planned the turn and I mean, you, you're not talking about a lot of square footage there and, and, and you made it feel roomy and almost like an architectural element. And yeah, you added to the space, even though you were taking away from the space. Yeah. Well, it, it makes it uh, feel better for sure. Yeah. I don't, you know, it doesn't really take up any less space, but it makes it more useful. Stairs in general are just a great way to add a sculptural mm-hmm. type of element to a space and, and add to the feel of the space, even though, like Kylie said, you're taking something away from it. I, uh, if I, the next one I think I'm going to do is going to be an excuse to develop my metalworking chops, uh, nice. get a welder nice. and, you know, make it out of steel. Cause I, I've always wanted to do that. And, you know, it seems like a good application for steel because it's strong and light and visually cool looking. Yeah. So, uh, as usual, we got some great feedback from our listeners. Uh, the first comes from Walter Patrick on today's podcast, uh, one seven, you all agreed that getting the filter housing off was the worst part of a whole house water filter change. I thought so too. Then one day for no good reason, I opened a faucet after I'd shut off the water before I tried to get a, that canister housing off. Easy peasy. Try it. Constant listener, Walter. <laughs> so what he's saying is if you relieve the pressure, the water pressure, uh, it's going to be easier to get that off. And I think most housings have a um, way to relieve the pressure so, so you don't even have to go and find a faucet to take off pressure. But I don't know if that's always the problem, but I bet it does help. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? I haven't had to change mine yet, but uh, my six months is coming up here Uh probably at the end of February that we've been living here. So I'm going to, I'm going to try what he said. Do you have the big filter housing or one of the like smaller it's ones? One of the giant ones. Yeah. It looks like an oversized paint can. Right. Mm-hmm. I'd be curious uh, how that goes. <laughs> probably not. Well, I'm going to screw it up. I know it. <laughs> um, Tom Cardillo, who's the plumber that's been in fine home building. Uh, we did a story with him and, um, his idea is to put a bypass in, in the, in, and a filter loop. So inevitably when the fil- filter housing leaks, you have a way to have the water on, uh, instead of frantically trying to go find an O-ring or a new filter uh, canister or whatever. And I was like, that's really smart. Hey, yeah. I have a question about this because when I've been dealing with my whole well situation, the guy who replaced my tank took my filter off and away, um, and I am now filterless. And essentially, this should get rid of sediment, right? It's to preserve the life of your tank, correct? Yeah. That's why you really want to do it. And keep your fixtures cleaner, right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's I, important in my system because I have a full iron filtration system uh, that's two more sediment tanks. Uh, so I've, I've got a lot going on, and I, I really need to keep that filter cleaner. It's going to choke that whole system off. And I would suspect that your Sandpoint well is going to allow more uh, particulates than Correct. many and other types of well, right? I'm guessing. Because yeah, like I in a drilled well, the, a lot of the sediment 
settles out in the water column to the bottom of the well. That makes sense. Yeah, Especially I really need to replace that. When you're 245 feet deep like mine is. Holy Moses. I got 400. I'm not bragging. And they charge you by the <laughs> foot, right? Don't they? they yeah, oh, yeah, they did. Our, our guy was pretty good, though, because he felt bad. Uh, he's done most of the wells in the area, and he's like, yeah, there's there's like you and two other people that are over that, you know, 175. So um, I think he just charged me an hourly rate. What'd your nice. well cost, Ian? 15 grand. Oh. Yeah. Mine was 10. So let's stop talking about wells. It's like, it's, it is the most stressful piece of my life right now. But it's, it's, it is neat to learn about them and what, what it is, they entail. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. They, they yeah. were here for over a month doing mine because they did it at the end of February. And it was just like daily. My wife and I would come by and we'd be like, <laughs> water? And he'd be like, nope. <laughs> nope. And then he'd, you know, then he'd do the, you know, what the depth he was at was uh -oh. like oh my god this is gonna break us <laughs> right yeah how much casing did you have to buy ian i i'd have to look i'm gonna pull it up because he did a water test too like kylie was talking about so i want to see what um what our test was mm. you know what i think is interesting is uh i mean well there's wells on new new construction sites right which are a heck of a lot easier than dealing with an existing site with a septic tank and an old well and very little room. And Absolutely. there's just, I mean, it gets really complicated. A drilling rig is an enormous truck. E oh right. my goodness. It is right. huge. Just getting it in. Yeah. yeah. This comes from uh, Derek. Hello, podcast crew is a fellow builder who is about to embark on yet another large personal building project. I enjoyed listening to the discussion with Ian about what it costs to build your own house. Included in the equation were the carrying costs or borrowing expense for the, for the loan, and rightly so. What is often missing from these conversations is what economists call opportunity costs. In other words, what you would have made if you were doing something else, like going to work. In Ian's case, unless he routinely takes 3,000 hours off work each year to pursue a <laughs> hobby or other unpaid venture, those lost wages are a portion of the true cost of the project, Granted, some of those hours were evenings, holidays, weekends, etc. but I'm sure the greater portion were during work hours when he could have been compensated for his time if he were on another project. The reason I think it matters is that aspiring owner builders and seasoned builders who often don't count all the costs, myself included, underestimate what it truly costs to build out a project. Sweat equity is rarely free. In Ian's case, let's say his labor rate is $40 an hour, though I'm sure it's higher. Not counting his labor, he is just under $342,000 into the project and it appraised for four sixty, dollars a difference of one eighteen. dollars Now, taking his 3,000 hours of labor, multiplied by $40, is $120K, or an additional $43.51 per square foot, for a total of $167.51 per foot. So his house is basically worth what he put into it. That's not a bad place to be, but to say the house only cost 342000 to build is a stretch. Love the show. It just keeps getting better and better. Wow. What a good point, right, Ian? What do you think? It, it is a good point, and I've heard the point before, but I think opportunity cost is, is pretty flawed, and there's a certain amount of it that's like microeconomic voodoo. But uh, <laughs> in, in my case... You know, I get paid about 30 bucks an hour as an estimator. So you take the taxes out of that, that's a $25 an hour actual cash value of my time. Uh, during the year I built the house, to keep my health insurance through TDS, I had to work 20 hours a week. So that's 50% time. So I, my opportunity cost is really 1,000 hours of work that I would have put in at TDS at $25 of actual cash value an hour for 25 grand. Um, you know, Derek would maybe, and others would want to talk about the opportunity cost of me working in an office when I'm still in, you know, prime field working condition and could be making $45 an hour. But uh, that's the problem with opportunity cost is it, it gets into personal values and mm. uh, life decisions that aren't, exactly quantifiable in money. That's a really um, good point. But if you look at my opportunity cost of the 1,000 hours, is the th of the 3,000, I worked about 2,000. The other 1,000 was my dad, Sarah, her dad, some buddies on the weekends, things like that. Um, 
but I would have to replace my labor with professional labor with a burdened, marked up labor rate, which in my area is about 75 an hour. So I'm still 50 cheaper per hour. Uh, so that, that's the other side of the opportunity cost. Uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people will poke some holes in that because I'm not an economist, but that's the way I look at it. And I, those are valid Putting points. aside yeah. the joy of building your own place. Right, I mean, yeah, you exactly. know, right, right. like That's one of those, you know, can't be measured costs. Yeah, or, and it's... Or values, rather. Right, and I think because I strongly threw out right away on the fine home building house stuff that I was going to do this as an open book. Here's what I spent kind of project. Mm -hmm. uh, I've gotten so much feedback from people through the website or through Instagram. And uh, it's, it's been really interesting, but the opportunity cost question has come up a couple of times. It's so great that you're doing that because costs seem to be that one sort of mysterious yeah. Nobody wants to talk about it. So when you can actually share them with readers, I think that's super valuable. Yeah. And for me, I mean, I have you know, nothing, nothing to hide really in the, in the cost. So I'm happy to talk about any, any of the line items that I went through for the that's project. Great. I think the, the question uh, in some ways overlooks the fact, but you brought it up, Ian, is that if you're not doing, you're paying someone else to do it, right? right? It, at much higher cost. And so right. what, what is, I don't know. If, I don't know if it's, it's, it's not an easy a, thing to answer. It's still right. a good point to consider though. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. some people might, might not think about it, you know? Sure. Yeah. If you're some custom, uh, crafts person building, you know, $50,000 sets of stairs for people in you know, a fancy area like New York city or Boston or Chicago. Yeah. You're going to have a much higher opportunity cost than, someone like me who's already made life decisions to try and simplify their life for a, a better long-term quality of life. I'm betting those people don't want to build staircases on their weekends either. Uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, this comes from Craig. I've heard of this product, Green Glue, for soundproofing. My brother mentioned it to me, and I recalled Matt Reisinger doing a review of this product a few years ago. Um, so this is in relation to our conversation we've been having about um, sound attenuation and ways to do that. And my understanding with this product is you put it between two layers of drywall and it's a Vizio elastic material, which means it's kind of flexible, which is good at stopping sound when combined with the mass of drywall. Uh, yep. So this is a question that I put out to the GBA audience and I got some great feedback. Can I share it? Please. Um, first of all, Somebody talked about the science of it, which I thought was kind of interesting, which, because I didn't know anything about it. So it's dampening compound that turns vibrations into heat, which dissipates energy, making the sound go away. I'm not sure if that's it entirely- sounds like a like a t t infomercial, right? <laughs> yeah. How, okay, so, so, so practical information. Mike Main says that it's easy to use and doesn't smell, and, but most of the benefit comes from the fact that there's that she second sheet of drywall um, and that the acoustics, um, well, he goes on and on. But, um, but it is really useful for sealing around the edges of walls and penetrations. Um, again, same thing that Mike, uh, Bill Robinson shared. But... Um, what were those to the little couple of tidbits that um, he says, Bill Robinson, if you want to cut down on sound transmission, which it sounds like this is the priority for this guy, um, and budget is tight, just put a second layer of uh, five eighths inch drywall and know that you're close to what you would have if you use the green glue. Uh, like, in other words, it's not going to make that big of a difference. Yeah. However, he... I would love to point this um, listener to this thread on GBA because there, it, in, a great conversation ensued and the, um, Bill offered some really great suggestions for other approaches um, beyond this product um, and some really good tips for getting sound attenuation right. Um, so I'll share that link. Uh, it was an interesting conversation. Cool. Yeah. The, One there of the are smart people that... there. Yeah. One of the things that we used to do in hospital construction when I was in uh, commercial work was we would use just regular joint compound to laminate two layers of drywall. And then we would use uh, this really coarse threaded, uh, we would call them rock to rock screws. I'm sure they have a 
an actual name, but the key we felt was always to make sure that you staggered your joints that and is. staggered your screw pattern so that you were never screwing the second sheet all the way through the first sheet into the stud so that you, you maintained that break layer uh, even with your screws. So with using that kind of caulk, I guess the fact that this product stays flexible and viscous right. has something to do with it, even yeah, after it's set. So. Yeah, yeah. We always Could, use the compound so that we could use less screws. And I'm guessing it was way cheaper than green glue. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is that a standard uh, detail in a hospital? Ian, all rooms? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Just, it's it's a pretty standard detail in a lot of them, and uh, the architecture firm that did all the work for that hospital in Poughkeepsie, I think was one of the largest architecture firms in America mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, and they had full details. And I want to say the, the compound was like an alternate detail that you could use. And they provided a, uh, you know, screws per board kind of pattern. Those screws are interesting. Um, for folks who aren't, don't, aren't familiar with them, Ian is describing a screw that's like an inch long, right? And mm -hmm. it's, meant to screw drywall to other drywall and not the framing. And it's yep. kind of a cool thing. Yeah. Can't use them with a gun though. <laughs> or, there's a, uh, there's a your million, million, there's your million dollar idea, right? Yeah, if you could figure out a collation. One. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they'll, they'll strip out the, the drywall. Oh, mm -hmm. that I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we used them with a regular cordless on a like real low chuck setting and that would usually work. I bet you have to train people not to screw that up uh, the first few times, right? Yep. <laughs> uh, this comes from Dak. Hello, podcast people. On episode 420, I think, Ian said he installed hydronic radiant heat in his recent build, defying Martin Holiday, not to mention <laughs> Patrick McComb. A couple of questions. What led Ian to go with this option, uh, defying Martin Holiday, and despite building a passive house and knowing better? <laughs> On Ian's sponsor mini split video, he says the radiant is used as backup, but on episode 420, I think, he made it sound like it was the primary and the mini split was secondary. Well, which is it? So I <laughs> Calm think down, Dak. Dak. <laughs> I, I like he Dak. does get Dak, riled up. <laughs> Dak has commented on some of the fine home building house yeah, stuff too fun. that I've done. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think what he picked up on was um, my comment that the radiant heat is the only heat in our garage. Mm. So it is the primary heat in there because a, a mini split couldn't couldn't handle that. Uh, but so for our house, we don't quite meet passive house. I think the passive house BTU per square foot is 4.75 and we're at just over nine. And a lot of that is due to that. I just couldn't pull the trigger on, you know, a $70,000 window package instead mm -hmm. of an $18,000 one. Uh, and then I think our roof is R67 or 70 as opposed to R80. But uh, the standard for a house in zone six BTU per square foot is 60. So we're still way better than, than what the rule of thumb is. Uh, but as far as why I went against the advice of the anti-radiant heat podcast, <laughs> um, <laughs> One, we had it at our house in New York, and we just really liked the radiant heat and the hot floors. But what really made me feel confident about it was I found a way uh, through a calculator online to determine the amount of footage of packs that I needed to put in the slab that's in our basement and the first floor assembly so that I didn't create a slab that was going to overheat the house. Mm. And once I had that, I was able to figure out how to do the, the layout of the slab for the basement and the layout of the staple up in our first floor system. And so far it's, it's kept up pretty good when, when it gets too cold out and the mini splits can't keep up. I looked at my app for controlling our thermostats that run the boiler. The thermostat in our basement where our bedrooms are, which is fully exposed to the Southeast, and no other sides, runs an average of two hours a day to top off the mini split. And the one on our main floor, which we do have set to turn on an hour before we get up, 
turn off once we leave for work and then turn on again an hour before we get home just to warm up the upstairs runs for about six hours a day on average in this uh, December and January cold snaps we've been getting. I just got an article in from Fernando uh, Pages Ruiz about, uh, it's a topic I assigned to him, are warm floors wasteful? So keep an eye out for that. Yeah. Uh, I look forward to seeing what research he came up with. Yeah, it seems like a contentious topic. It is contentious. So for me, I did all the install myself so you know, it's another opportunity cost thing. I think the install of this would have been you know, 20 plus thousand dollars had I not done the bulk of it myself. And the uh, state of Wisconsin allows the homeowner to install their own heating system as well. You don't have to buy code, uh, have a licensed HVAC guy do it. Hmm. I'm sure you've seen a lot of these in your residential work. When, when you were installing your tubing did it look appreciably less than what you would have seen more typically in uh you yeah. know a residential yeah so yeah, it was I, noticeably less i have one run of tubing in each joist bay whereas typically you would have them at six or seven inches on center wow. so mine are 16 on center and then same thing in the slab is that because it's secondary or um, it's secondary, and then our, our heat load from my energy modeling is under 25,000 BTUs. Got it. Okay. So because our, your envelope's so tight, right? Right, because we have the 12 inch thick walls, and we're, you know, we beat the passive house air tightness uh, standard. So I think that's what really helps us because we are out here kind of in the middle of a field and routinely get 20 mile an hour plus winds, and you wouldn't know it sitting in our house even mm. with the uh, double pane windows instead of triples. Well, Dak uh, concludes by saying, thanks for any inf info. I'm trying to figure out how to heat and cool my forthcoming build in the same climate zone and really, really like hydronic floor heat. Well, Dak, that's reason enough to do it, man. <laughs> it's your <laughs> house, right? That's right. Yeah, and Dak should just keep, keep asking questions and feel free to reach out to me uh, through the magazine or through Instagram, and if you've got any other questions, I'm, I'm sure he's looking to build a pretty similar system to what I did. It's uh, I, I just say it, Patrick. <laughs> you hate it. You think it's a terrible <laughs> idea. I don't think it's a terrible well, idea. I think it's needlessly costly, is what I would say. Um, I agree. If you got to pay a professional to do it, it's, it's needlessly it's expensive. costly. Yeah. I, I did a pre-made panel from this company called Floor Heat in Michigan. So it, everything was already installed, just hung on the wall, had to connect it to the boilers and then connect it to the, uh, the manifolds, which I'm sure Dak has seen if he's watched that uh, sponsored content video. So your, uh, your panel includes the circulators and the, yep. the controller, and yep. this is plug and play, ready-made thing. Exactly. It's cool. just hanging on that the wall cool. next to the boiler, and it was a couple connections, and then adding the, the manifolds that you need per the amount of loops you have. Hmm. You know, well, part, of my, part oh. of my resistance to radiant might be my disdain for plumbing work generally. <laughs> so, you know, of course, there's my own bias in, in this whole conversation. It's very what were you going to say, Kylie? Of, I was going to say it's very generous of you, Ian, to share your tips based on what you learned. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, I learned a lot of stuff, and for the most part, I wouldn't change a lot. I think there's things that I look back on, and when you're in that panicked state of building your house, and we'll talk about it later with the question on sequencing, um, you kind of lose sight of a certain amount of like efficiency just because you get in this mindset, if I got to get this done. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you, you, what, what has to get done changes because you have to move into it, right? Right. <laughs> right. <Yes. laughs> This comes from Jerry. Hi, FHB crew. Maybe I missed it, but someone asked about low-maintenance black exterior trim. I think this was Barbara. We're definitely seeing this trend in southeast Michigan. We install a lot of Pella windows, and they offer what they call frame expanders and other casing, casing accessories. They're usually metal trim pieces that fit on the channel on the outside of the window. We, used, we typically used L-shaped versions when we install windows and brick openings, but I think they have other profiles. We also work with a roofing contract that does barn siding and metal roofs. They have a machine that bends the metal coil stock on site and they can set their equipment up for different shapes and profiles. These companies may be able to make corn trim, casing, and fascia set up with J-channel edges or flanges. 
Dark aluminum trim seems to expand and contract a bit when installed, so maybe this kind of thing should be installed loose like vinyl siding. I have to admit, we tend to lean toward Boral True Exterior and paint it after the install. There you go. That's, I think, a lot of what we said. Yeah, um, that's what we recommended, yeah. Yeah, and so, it should be noted that the, the Pella frame expanders, I, I worked for Pella as an installer for a year during my apprenticeship, they're a much heavier gauge aluminum than your standard coil stock. So they do move less. But one of the things that we were instructed was to back caulk the flange that you then pounded into the window, uh, into the groove on the outside of the window frame to minimize any kind of movement. And then I think we also caulked any uh, overlapping joints on the frame expanders as well. And I think most window manufacturers have them, but I've only ever installed the Pella ones. I think they all have them. I know Marvin does. And, uh, you know, Anderson was usually the least uh, flexible when it came to uh, options for installation, especially with their lower end products. But mm -hmm. I, I hear they've gotten better with that, too. So Jerry has a question, although he says, not really a question, but I'd like to hear some discussion of the construction process. Generally, we move from demo to framing, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, insulation, drywall, priming, Floral and flooring and tile, trim, paint, final electric, countertops, final plumbing, final HVAC, appliances, final carpentry. Sometimes the schedule just breaks down. If we are replacing a kitchen, we may install cabinets as soon as the drywall is sanded so we can have the countertops measured. It, it usually takes two weeks to get them installed after that, and we can't bring in the plumber or appliances until that's done. So it's usually a major slowdown in progress. That means our painter may be priming later than we'd like and our flooring installer may only be able to install up to the toe kick and not the wall and may save a couple days or weeks when you're living, but when you're living without a kitchen uh, in your house, that can feel like an eternity. Sometimes a trade may just not be available when you need them so you're faced with a dilemma. Do you wait or move on and leave your clients with a headache? I'd like to hear your, what your opinions are. Are there any tricks to keeping things moving along even when they're out of sequence? Thanks as always, Jerry. It's <sighs> a great question. Seems like an Ian question. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things that, that we did when we were trying to finish our house frantically to move in was uh, I knew what my plumber's schedule was and I, I knew I had a very narrow window to get him in here. So I tiled only the walls of the shower that had plumbing <laughs> so, so that he could come in and install the plumbing on them. and just did a lot of stuff like that and it was so far out of sequence and it drove me nuts but when you think about the getting your subs and trade partners in it's just so important to hit their schedule days and to be able to move the rest of the pieces around as you need to but uh, i think it comes down to project management and communication mm -hmm. between uh, you as a general and the client and then also with your subs to try and come up with what the best case scenario is Hey, um, do you guys know Helm Solutions? Yep. Is one of their services to, I feel like it rings a vague bell that maybe they kind of help orchestrate that to, I, I guess my question is, are there services to ensure sequencing happens the way it should? <laughs> uh, your GC should be doing that or your mm. lead carpenter yeah. or whatever, but... You know, it's never perfect, and everyone wants it to be perfect, but it seldom is. And right. the reason I, you try not to do it is because inevitably it takes longer, right? right. It, it stretches things out. When, when, when the work is really not ready for you, you have to come back, or you have right. to make some work around. And I don't know, it's yeah, it's I not ideal, exposure. but you, you do what you could. Yeah, I had some exposure to the people at Helm uh, mm -hmm. when I was in one of the Nessie. Uh, peer review groups mm -hmm. and I think my understanding is they're really out there to help GCs get better at these things right and to help that educate people on project management and estimating and things of that nature and to do it in in a more green and socially responsible way I know it's a big part of their their mission mm -hmm. The, the risk when you get out of the r typical order, too, is that stuff gets damaged, right? It's like that's another mm, big right. problem. Or now you lost. have to work or, or, lost, or lost or parts get lost. Yeah. 
But uh, sometimes you do have to do it because sometimes have to do it. you get the person who's like, I need my kitchen Memorial Day weekend. And you're like, wow, OK, can you can you use it without a floor? <laughs> you you up without a floor. <laughs> and I think that's that's a little bit of what Jerry's talking about. On job and, sites, do you see different crews coming in, getting all testy with each other? Because oh, yeah. they, sh yeah, I bet I can, <laughs> I can imagine that. That's why I think the communication is really key. If, if right. you are the project manager or lead on a job and you've got to have that relationship with the people you're bringing in so that you can tell them, hey, I'm sorry, it's going to be really messed up on this one, but here's the goal that we're working toward for whatever reason that is, uh, and, and we need you to do, do this weird thing to, yeah. to make this goal. It seems like design firm or design build firms often have the contractors that they have a long standing yeah. relationship with. And when when the design and the construction and the subs are kind of all accustomed to working together, it seems yep. the sequencing probably goes more smoothly. Yeah. And doing things out of sequence. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest uh, things in a design build firm that you have over firms that are just doing architect driven work and especially ones that are on prime contracts where there is no tie between a GC and a mechanical contractor, which is a little bit more common in commercial and, and large work. But mm -hmm. um, those are the ones where it's really difficult to go out of sequence because there's, there's no uh, method for a mechanical contractor to get paid more or taken care of in another way for for leaving the sequence and like Patrick said, coming back and mm -hmm. having to do rework. They are going to say, that's your problem. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me know when it's ready and I'll be there. Uh, right. And they might bill you for that van full of guys that showed up when it wasn't mm -hmm. ready. So I can tell you, uh, doing trade work, one of the most frustrating thing was, was not being able to do the job that you are trained and, and are supposed to be doing. It's like, that is the worst. You're, you're being held up and missed being forced to stand around. That is such a drag. Yeah, I can see that. People who do trade work do it because they like to get things done. They don't like standing around waiting right. for doing things. <laughs> What do you think about this, Jeff? I'm sure uh, when you're doing your own projects, you do all kinds of weird things, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I do. Just, well, yeah, it's whatever needs to get done to get to move along. Or to have dinner that night. Or yeah. to be able to, you know. <laughs> yeah, I got to flush the toilet at spouse. some point, you know. Right. <laughs> or to have a spouse that'll still talk to you the next Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this comes from... Matt in Baltimore, Maryland. Hey, podcast crew. I've noticed a strange thing on three houses I've looked at in the past two months. All three of them are roughly 100 years old, and all three have second-story rooms that extend over the porch. In all three houses, the floor of this second-floor room is humped up directly over where the exterior wall is, the back of the porch. There, these are all significant humps that you can easily notice as you're walking in the room. Two of the houses have cedar shingle siding and one had asbestos siding, but on all three, the siding outside was still perfectly lined up, <laughs> suggesting that there had been no movement, at least since the siding was installed, and, and none of the siding was very new. None of these rooms were over exterior second floor porches, which would account for a sloped floor. I haven't actually opened up any of these floors to look at what's going on. In all three cases, I've suggested leaving it as as is, since nothing appears to be currently moving. However, I would like to be able to tell the clients what's happening. I'm not sure if they were built like this or if things have settled in the past. Have any of you encountered anything like this? And I was going to go first because I used to work on a lot of crappy old houses in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and I was going to say that the porch footings had settled, but he says no because the siding is still perfectly level. So I really don't know what's going on, but every porch room that I was ever in in an old house um, had inadequate footings, and it starts to sink on the uh, edge that's farther from the house. So that was, that's all I can offer on this. Anyone else? So the, I, I don't know exactly what he's talking about, but I kind of picked up on what you had, Patrick, where porch footings is, you know, the first thing you think of. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of like the, the raised ranches that you see that were built in the 70s and 80s all around New York and Connecticut and, mm -hmm. and the Northeast where they have that you know, two foot overhang on the what would be the main floor hanging over the 
you know, half exposed basement floor. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing stuff like that, like humps in the floor. And is it possible that you have the, you know, the joists that are supported by that wall are drying out or swelling and reacting differently than the ones that are hanging over the house and they're hmm. probably improperly air sealed and uh, a little bit more exposed to the outside. And Would there be moisture capillary action in the wall that they're overhanging? Because that's a foundation stem wall, right? In right. the houses that you're describing. Yeah. So those joists might be more susceptible to water, right? Exposure? Yeah, or some, some other kind of, you know, outside element that's making them react differently. But even then, I don't know if that's enough to really make a hump in the floor in the, the way that Matt's talking about. You know, in these situations where I don't really know the, this, the problem or a solution, uh, what <laughs> I like to do is just change the conversation. Uh, so... <laughs> Um, I oh, like that strategy, Patrick. <laughs> what I found interesting about this is that these rooms, I'm guessing, were sleeping rooms that were part of an architectural thing that happened because of the Spanish flu pandemic in the very early part of the 20th century, which I think is very interesting. Huh. Unless we could talk about that instead. <laughs> right. And in Maryland, you would, you would have the cooler night climate versus the hot day where sleeping in an, in an outdoor sleeping porch would would make more sense. It would be miserable uh, in that in the summertime in in Maryland, right? It'd be hot. Yeah. And... Matt, I don't know what's going on. Maybe some listeners have a uh, suggestion on, on what's going on with these buildings. Um, maybe we should spin the uh, Diagnosis board, Jeff. The <laughs> <laughs> we haven't used that in a long time. I, I think it's time. Don't they all say air sealing? <laughs> <laughs> this comes from Kenneth from uh, Acton, Ontario, Canada, an hour west of Toronto, 15 minutes north of Mike Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> he has his uh, resume here. Two-year college course in cabinet making, seven years framing houses, 14 years in residential high rise. So I didn't know exactly what uh, Kenneth meant by that. So he sent me a photograph of his job and I'm sorry I didn't put that and share it with y'all, but he's apparently building uh, the largest residential development in, uh, in all of Canada. This, this project is a multi-use um, high rise residential thing and it is quite impressive. So. Wow, that's uh, cool. Yeah. I wanna see that. It's cool. It's. It, it's one of those projects where, like, you don't even know where you would start. It is just so big. Uh, hi, podcast crew. I've been working through all the episodes as fast as I can. You all do an amazing job. I thoroughly enjoy listening and learning. I have a 1970s north-facing 1,300-square-foot mansard roof bungalow with a walkout eight-foot headroom, mostly unfinished basement. It has concrete foundation walls and a concrete slab. The basement is fairly dry, a heavy rain will give me a wet slab in one area along the west wall. The walls have no insulation or waterproofing. With the steep grade difference to the back of the house, a, a lot of the foundation is ex exposed. The main floor cantilevers at the front of the house about two feet on a two by four knee wall that's insulated with paper faced bats. The knee wall is faced with brick on the outside. On the main floor, the outside walls are two by four with craft faced fiberglass bats. The sheathing is Type X style gypsum board. The roof is a 312 pitch truss roof with a mansard applied to the two by four walls and tied to the tails of the trusses. It returns to the mudstone rim board. I had the shingles on it replaced this summer. I am replacing the windows one by one as I update each room. Question one. How would you go about waterproofing slash insulating the basement? I want to make it a livable area. Radon mitigation would be an added bonus. I tested for radon when I moved in last year and my levels were low, but in my head, no radon is better than low. Okay, so you need to put uh, polystyrene on the interior, right, folks? Isn't that what we always tell people? I thought with existing homes it was more widely recommended to install some kind of an active system. 
Oh, for radon. I was right. thinking what of are you insulating. Talking about? I'm talking oh, about insulating I'm, with oh, polystyrene. Right, right, right. I'm already thinking about radon. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, you know, to deal with radon, you need to depressurize below the slab with, you know, either pipes or a fan. You don't always need the fan. Um, but I think you need to test again and see yeah. what your actual levels are to determine what you need to do. And then you need someone to design a system. That's not a DIY project, I'm sure. Right. So I looked into this a bit, and Randy Williams just wrote about um, active and passive radon systems in both new construction and existing homes. And out of the conversation that ensued, I don't know what this reader listener's question, I mean, uh, level is, but the EPA recommends homes be fixed for radon if the level is 4PCIL, which is pyocuries per liter or more. So maybe he doesn't need to solve for radon, if depending on what the reading is. Anyone else want to talk about radon? No, I don't one either. Of the, one, <laughs> one of the things that we do in, in basement uh, finishing jobs at TDS is we usually do a dimple mat on mm. the walls irregardless, and then you would insulate over that either with spray foam or, or a rigid board and then build your walls in front of that or insulate within the walls. Um, and in finished basements where they do have water problems, we'll actually add an interior drain line. So we'll cut up the concrete slab about a foot off the wall, dig that out, put in the drain tile, and we'll connect the dimple mat down into that trench to make sure that anything that does come in the walls is allowed to run down into the drain tile, and then we install a sump crock. Uh, it's it ends up being a pretty expensive line item in finishing a basement, but it really depends on what you want to use the space for. There's some I great... like that is it manages water and you're not trying to keep it out. Right. Because, you know, when it's you have that one event, it's, yep. it's going to overcome even your best drainage system outside potentially. There's a section in, um, in the GBA detail library for building plans for uh, energy efficient, efficient basement remodeling, and it gets into all kinds of aspects, and the details are there. So I, I will share that link too. Seems like a good place for this listener to look. Kenneth has a couple other questions that, frankly, I'm more interested in. So uh, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> he says, uh, "Any ideas on how to insulate air seal the walls behind the mansard roof?" This void is attic space. I plan on redoing the soffits and eaves troughs. At, at that point, I would have access, although not much. Can I glue slash nail a polyiso slash EPS board to the gypsum sheathing, wedging it under the trusses to the mansard? I don't know if I could get the joints taped to the top. I could cock the fa face of each joint as I put each sheet up. I don't really like spray foam. Okay, so I'm going to try and explain what's going on with uh, Kenneth's house. Um, so he has a mansard roof, and unlike uh, a traditional mansard that has, you know, thick rafters for the sloping high, the steep slope section, he's got a normal stud wall and then these like fake mansards attached uh, onto the outside. And in between, there seems like there's nothing. And on the on the wall of the house, it's sheathed with, sheathed with these gypsum two by eight panels none of which are air sealed. So I'm sure he's got a pretty leak, leaky and uncomfortable house. And I did um, mention that to him and he, he, he conceded that it's, it's not very comfortable and he uses a lot of energy to keep it cool and warm. Do you uh, cool think the warm. reason the, that that construction is what it is is because this mansard roof was added after the fact? Or do you think this is the original mansard roof? Why, I think in this it? period, this is how people were doing it's it. It's how they did it. Yeah, oh. and you, you know, you see like, office buildings that some have this treatment and it doesn't look like an old school mansard roof uh like victorian style it's it looks different and it's got yeah. a hip uh, roof yeah. on the top yeah 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 so i think you got it you need an air barrier kenneth uh somehow and then he asks about waterproofing these inset windows because it looks like the windows are installed uh in the plane of the uh houses in exterior wall and not the outer mansard uh, addition, right? Right, Ian, is that what you gathered? That's what I got too from the photo and just from his description. 
that's a hard thing to deal with. You're talking about what amounts to an any window, right? So, yep. Kenneth, I think you got to look to some passive house details that do inset windows and rely on good tape and uh, you know shingle style lapping. It, this is not an easy thing to get right. No, and he talks about using uh, blue skin or something else as a WRB, which is a great place to to start, uh, and then making sure that the sill of that any window is pitched out and has good enough pitch to move any uh, any water. I would be a little bit concerned about him being in. He's in Ontario. Yeah. So I'm sure he's in in an area that does get snow. Uh, whether or not he gets it blowing in on what he says is a north facing uh, exposure. But I would think you'd want to make sure that you don't ever get snow sitting in there and melting and freezing and possibly working its way in under the window. Am I right to think that mansard roofs present all kinds of issues that more straightforward roofs do not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause you're, it's a roof wall, right? Yeah. It's, it's not, yeah. it's not easy to detail. So what would, what would you guys use for his interior air barrier then? <sighs> One of those smart membranes, I'm guessing, and tape the seams and detail it from the interior maybe. Yeah. Um, it's not, it's not going to be a accessible, I don't think, to get it from the outside. Am I, am I wrong about that? I don't think so. That, that was what my thought was, was to do something on the inside, even if it's as low tech as CDX or OSB with the joints taped. Um, you know, I can say that Canadians, uh, as a rule, use uh, polyethylene uh, right. as an air barrier. And uh, boy, Kenneth, you already got all the stuff uh, at your disposal, the red tuck tape and the little... Um, panels that you put behind electrical boxes that you tape to to seal those. I mean, you know, my understanding is that stuff's all readily available in a mainstream lumber yard in Canada because that's how they uh, create an air barrier in their climate. And there's been a recent study that suggests or shows, demonstrates, proves that OSB is not a great air barrier. So True. Some. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Some. I mean, it depends, right? The good stuff... It can, but not necessarily. That wasn't my takeaway from this article. Yeah? Well, yeah. lay it on me. Set me straight. Just that it's not something that you should rely on as an air barrier. Hmm. There's... Plywood's okay? Yeah, there was comparison to plywood. Plywood performed better. Hmm. Do you know what the, the test was that they yeah. did to determine this? Yeah, look it this? up. I don't remember... I don't remember who performed the study. This is about two months ago, but it's it's something that we published on GBA. So let me look it up. I'll get back to you. So I've seen it done pretty commonly. I have even been in homes that Ben Bogey did, and they were he and Dan Colbert were using that method in in pretty good house style builds. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's you know, it's just information to have. Yeah. Well, what I think was determined in like some super high performance homes that used OSB as an air barrier, when they went to get their blower door numbers, they weren't meeting them because air was physically leaking through the panels. So mm -hmm. you, you, they had to use then a spray applied WRB to, uh, as a, you know, air control layer in addition to a water control layer. Hmm. And that's why you brought up about using the cheap. Uh, home center grade OSB versus, you know, something like a LP Yeah, because, I mean, I've also seen where that is the primary air barrier and works fine. And I would say Zip system is a OSB product. It's got a surface on it that is, right. you know, meant to be an air barrier and water resistive barrier. So right. normal OSB is not that. RDH Building Science performed this research and concluded, and I'm not reading through the whole article, but the, they compared OSB to plywood and OSB sheathing from Huber, the, the zip system. Um, and, to, and this is specifically to meet passive house levels of air tightness. So that should be considered, of course. Um, and that in the case of OSB, the answer of whether or not it's a, an effective air barrier is probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway it's an interesting study to read about wait right, way to even, get the uh, apa mad at us kylie that's super <laughs> thanks 
<laughs> Even with the, the passive house stuff, like when I did the math for Dak's question of what my BTU per square foot is, you know, the, the reason I stopped at that is it's just a gargantuan undertaking to shave that little bit extra off to meet those passive house standards. You know, when you've already dropped it from uh, a rule of thumb of 60 down to nine, but that's where you really need those studies that Kylie referenced to be able to, to shave those to last there. couple BTUs per square foot off. This is when we love the pretty good house. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. I was this just thinking about, you, you know, you've gone into all this trouble to, to build this high performance home. And then you, you're like, why is my nor blower door number not working? <laughs> why is my blower door number not working? You can imagine Material how scary choice. that is, right? Yeah. We're still going to try and get our guy out here uh, next month to do a, a finished blower door because our, our number was before insulation. And I think we were at like 0.58. Uh, ACH, wow. so we were just under the the passive house number at that point. So without insulation. Without insulation, so That's I'm interested awesome. to to see where we're at after the the dense packing and the uh, roof insulation. How many blower doors have you done? I've just done the one on the house. Mm -hmm. When we did that, it was kind of the thing where like, okay, we made it. We'll wait till move the end on. Now. <laughs> move on. Um, so it's just been hard getting uh, him out here. He's, you know, the nearest ones are like Madison and Milwaukee, which um, for them to spend two and a half hours uh, on the road to do a, a half an hour blower door at my house, mm. I'm like the, the low, low hanging uh, fruit for them. They're Patrick will do it. do it. He's done all of ours. Yeah, I'm gonna drive out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We have our Hall of Fame with blower door numbers. And Je Jeff's the, the lead, uh, lead, uh, tops the leaderboard. Wow. Well, yeah. not anymore. What was not, it again? not compared to Ian's. Oh, that's right. But he doesn't have an official number yet, so. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Jeff, and then yours? Patrick will have to vet it. <laughs> right. um, what were you going to say, Kylie? Oh, I just was curious. I forgot what, what um, the reading was at, at Jeff's house. I was right around, he was around three. three. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I don't know why I remember that. I can't remember my mom's phone number, but I can remember <laughs> your blower door numbers. Oh it's my the goodness! Anyone, stuff, you know, it is right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to uh, talk about anything or bring anything up before we go? Uh, exciting taunting stuff we should talk about, Kylie. IBS is coming up, and we'll have show coverage, right? Yep, and um, yep, there'll be some GBA articles generated from what. Fernando finds in terms of products and just interesting ideas. So we're going to be covering that. The BS and Beer Show is, is happening there. They're recording two podcasts with Christine Williamson and her dad, Joe Stebrick. And uh, who are the other guests? I forget the other guests. Um, but there are two shows being recorded live. So that's fun. From the show. I, uh, I can't wait to hear about it. It's going to be awesome. All right, folks. Oh, Carl Seville and Michael Angui. Those are the two other guests. Oh, Michael is... He's fun. And Carl is awesome, T too. That's together, great. Together, they're yeah. such a team. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'm going to pull the plug here, y'all. Okay. Well, unfortunately, this, all, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Kylie, Ian, and Jeff for joining me. And thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to FHB Podcast at Taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Happy building. Thanks very much for listening. Bye.